So as I introduced, my name is Todd Olson, CEO and co-founder of Pendo. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our growth story today and hopefully pick out a few tips and tricks and learnings that we had along the way that you can apply to your business. Um, this is the growth trajectory they were talking about. And I think what's interesting about this is that um, uh, it's not just a matter of high growth. Um, when we started the company, we had a thesis around selling to product teams. And um, it was a brand new market, no real budget. And one of the challenges when we tried to raise our seed round is um, you can't sell to product teams because they don't have budget. And you can hear, see here that we've, we've countered a little bit of that. And, um, and I, I want to talk about how we did that because I think there's some important lessons in that. Um, T2D3 is a term or acronym coined by our Series A investor, Nir Jagarwal. It stands for triple, triple, double, double, double. And that's been the playbook, or that's been the model we've been trying to implement since, uh, since the very beginning. Um, I think the other notable thing that I'll say, in addition to creating a new category, focusing on a department that had no budget, is that we also did it out of um, well, not the Bay Area. So I know that a lot of folks here are from other parts uh, of the country, specifically here. And we're headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we did all of that there. Um, and it was not, uh, well, it was challenging at times, but I, it didn't really hold us back. Um, now, the key is there isn't really any magic. I wish there was. I wish uh, um, that there was something that we did that was like, wow, this is Nirvana moment. But um, it's really about three things. It's about getting the product right, obsessing over customers, and building a great culture. And that's really been our recipe. And as I say a lot to the company, both internally and externally, um, Pendo's is a steak company, not a sizzle company. You know, so if we're going to win, we're going to win because um, it's meaty. Like there's something real there, right? So I, I would much rather have something that uh, has as of substance and something that's just a lot of hype. So if anything, we're underhyped. You may not even have heard of us. Um, and while we need to fix that, and there's work to do building our brand, the reality is what's important is we get the fundamentals right. If you get the fundamentals right, growth will come. If growth will come, then you start to have a really valuable business, right? So the fundamentals are what I preach constantly. You do these things well, it leads to success. Um, but it's hard work, and you got to roll up your sleeves, and you have to sometimes get uncomfortable. And one of the first times, or the first time I got uncomfortable is uh, when we started selling the product. You know, I'm an engineer by training. Prior to this, I was a VP of product. Um, you know, early in our company's history, our board says, oh, you got a product now, you need to go hire some salespeople. And um, I decided to not take their, their advice on that, which was, a, which was a smart. And I decided to just go out and do it myself. And I realized early on that if I delegated the act of selling it, I was delegating all the feedback, I was delegating all of the iterations, um, and I was placing basically the success of the company in the hands of relative unknowns, right? So um, I think the really critical thing early on, if you want to get this right, is you have to do it yourself. You got to roll up your sleeves and get in it. And that's, that's, and sometimes get uncomfortable. And for me, selling um, was an unnatural motion for me. Um, the good news is after a few quarters, it becomes a more natural motion. And now I'm quite comfortable with it, but I, I think you have to get unnatural to do it. But I do think that if you follow this, this recipe, so to speak, success will come. Um, so getting the product right, um, as I said, I'm a product person, so I'm really, really passionate about getting the product right, but that's ultimately what matters first. A lot of people talk about product market fit, and it all starts with product in many cases. And the, the, the way I like to start is focusing on pain. And there's a you know, common adage in the product space, focus on, on Advil versus vitamins with this whole connotation that vitamins are nice to have and something like a painkiller, um, Advil is a must have, right? You can live without vitamins. If you're in massive pain, you can't live without um, a, a painkiller, right? So focus on pain. And I think it's really valuable bonus points if you have lived that pain and are comfortable with it. And that's where we started. I, mean, I started the company because as a VP of product, I didn't have visibility what was going on to my users. I was struggling to, to um, drive engagement in my product. When I went to go do this, it required lots of engineering time. And I don't know if about you, but I've never worked in a company where we have surplus engineers sitting around just waiting for projects to work on, right? So that was the fundamental pain. That was the thesis. And um, even today, five years later, almost five and a half years later, when I'm talking to a prospect, 
they know I've lived that pain. And um, it allows me to create empathy for the people we're selling to, and it honestly has led to more credible conversations and a better solution um, overall. A lot of times in the early days, folks would say, I really feel like you understand me. It's not that I understand them, it's that I understand the pain because I've lived it. And if you're in a situation where you can do this starting a business, you're, you're absolutely a leg above someone else. Um, the second thing, and once you understand that pain, is that you want to try to create something 10x better. Now, 10x better doesn't mean you have 10x more features. I think this is something that people often conflate. When they think better, they think more feature rich. Actually, I would say it's the opposite. In the early days, uh, as I said, so I lived this pain, and part of this pain was that I had to have lots of engineers do all this work. We set out to create a solution that required no engineers. That was the goal, day one, no engineering, which is aspirational, it's lofty, but it's also disruptive to the space. So if I'm competing against something that I know takes lots of engineers, and I build something that takes no engineers, that's 10x better, that's wildly disruptive. And the nice thing about focusing on something 10x better is that you don't need all the features if it's truly 10x better. People will live without things. And that's where I think there's often some confusion in markets and building products. You think you need to be feature complete. You think you need to have, um, uh, you know, to, to copy everything that people ask for. Sometimes you can just say no, and if it truly is 10x better, people will still use it. You know, we, we actually still have features in the product that we're adding now that we discussed adding in 2014 that we've grown just fine without them. You know, uh, it, some things it's even counterintuitive. I mean, in our space, um, like integrations. You know, we, we were asked very early on to integrate with a, with a common product. It's called Segment. You may have heard of it. A lot of you may use Segment. Um, and we just didn't do it. We didn't do it for years. And um, we eventually did it. But if, again, it, we were good enough, so much better at traditional solutions that people were willing to live without in a few circumstances. So I think that's really critical early on. Focus on this disruptive technology and good things will come from there. And then, of course, the, the next piece is measure and iterate. This is absolutely critical. So get something out there, measure and iterate. And sometimes what you're measuring and what you're iterating on may be somewhat counterintuitive. I'll never forget one of the early times working with customers. We shipped something and we noticed that the customer was using it a lot. Now you may think, oh, that's a really good thing. But we weren't anticipating this feature to be used a lot. It was actually an administrative feature that we thought would be used very sparingly. And then we saw this person using it like tens of times every single day which seemed really counterintuitive. So um, we decided to, of course, call up the customer, start talking about what, what they were doing. And we had just some amazing insights that we learned from this. She was trying to solve this use case that we hadn't even anticipated solving with our product. And she was doing it in probably the most cumbersome way humanly possible. Um, but she was getting success. She was accomplishing her task. And it was something that was so critical to her business that she was willing to live with this pain because it was solving a critical problem for her. So after that, we actually took this area of our product, we actually got rid of it and replaced it with a much more elegant way to solve it, completely different solution, completely different concept, all because we're measuring, iterating, and having real conversations with our customers. So um, I think the key thing here is, is once you get something ship it as quickly as possible and then immediately start trying to adjust it, immediately start trying to adapt it. Um, even today, we shipped a, a beta feature last week that we had done extensive discovery. Talked to almost 100 customers before we delivered it. Um, and we delivered it and we, you know, the next week we got this long email from a customer with a number of things that we had just never conceived of despite all of the discovery you do. So you, it's always different when you ship something. This is absolutely critical to get out there. And then, and then keep iterating on it. Put out small changes. Don't wait till it's perfect. The more you iterate, the better the product's going to be over time. And that's ultimately what matters first, is getting the product right. So if you do these three things, I think that'll put you in a, in a very enviable place from a product perspective. The second thing I want to focus on is obsessing, obsessing over your customers. This is absolutely critical. And you already heard me talk about it a little bit. I use words like empathy and um, talking to customers, doing interviews, but this is absolutely a critical piece. And, and I think there's a lot of value in asking a lot of questions. So when we started the company, 
we had a beta program where it was completely free to use the product. The only thing we asked for in return was weekly calls to give us feedback. And to me, weekly calls is valuable. That's people's time. And that feedback was critically valuable just to shaping our company and our products. So um, that to me was, was, was more valuable than money even at the time. So we did that for almost eight months where we just got people on calls every single week and asked a ton of questions. That was a very manual process. We were a very small company at the time. Now we do a lot of other surveys, things like Net Promoter Score. And Net Promoter Score has um, lots of, or lots of, some controversy around it. It is probably or not a perfect metric, um, but it's not a bad metric. It's actually a pretty good metric. And if someone's not willing to recommend you, I mean, there's learnings in that. Now, I think the problem with things like Net Promoter Score is that people too often focus on the number, the aggregate number. They're either boasting about it or sad about it. You know, it's either too high or too low or to hit some goal, maybe hit my OKR. I want an MPS of 40, great. But they're missing the power, and the power is how you decompose that number into different segments, different types of customers, different types of users. Are your new users happier than your older users? If your older users have been here for two years are really unhappy, well, that's an early warning indicator of churn. If you have small customers really unhappy but large customers really, really happy, well, maybe you're targeting the wrong market. Maybe you're thinking about your business a little differently. Those early surveys tell you a lot about where you should be focusing on. There's a really popular blog post going around about the superhuman product. And I'm, I don't know, who's read this, this blog post about superhuman? Uh, not enough of you, that's the answer. Uh, so I'd highly recommend it. It's a great article, but um, in the, the article, the founder of Superhuman talks about this metric for measuring product market fit. And it really comes down to this question, how would you feel if you could no longer use this product? Extremely disappointed to not disappointed at all. It's essentially a one through five scale. Um, and um, it's said that if you get to 40% of the, of the respondents are extremely disappointed, then you, quote unquote, have product market fit. This is what this article um, posits. And you know, we can argue whether 40% is the right metric or not, but, but it's a really, really valuable way of looking at your product. And what, what the article says, which is really powerful, is that they realize early on that their product isn't for everyone. And they leverage the feedback to understand who they should double down on and who they frankly should say, please don't use the product. So for example, if you, if you come to them and say, I want to use your product, and you don't have a certain type of computer, they know their product's slow on, uh, on other computers, and they basically tell you no. And that's how they've driven their growth, by being hyper-focused on customers that they can serve. And all of that is ascertained by this simple survey question. So asking questions, engaging heavily with customers, you get fascinating, um, fascinating results. The second thing, which is maybe a little bit uh, controversial, is it's OK to build a one-off. This is one where a lot of product people may, may disagree with. But if a customer comes to you and say, I will buy your product if you add X, some folks are like, well, that's building for one customer. That's not very purist. Um, the way I look at it is actually pretty different. If they asked me to build something that I was already planning to build, just planning to build it later, this is the best market validation I possibly could get. I can get money if I simply move that up. And the reason I'm comfortable doing that is that I don't treat my roadmap like something etched in stone. I mean, the lesson here is don't get emotionally attached to your roadmaps. It's all just a guess. You are literally guessing. And it's possible you guess wrong. And if a customer is willing to part with cash and give it to you, and that will drive some growth, chances are a couple other customers may too. They just haven't told you. They haven't been as direct to ask. And it's a really, really good feedback. Honestly, I think it's the best feedback you can get. If someone says, I will give you money if I do this, I take that all day long. Sometimes I say, yeah, sure, I'll do it in a quarter, and then sign the customer and just put a commitment to the contract. Now, now, granted, when you get to a certain scale, I'd be careful I wouldn't do a ton of these. Um, but it's a very, very, very powerful way to drive growth early. And as I said, in the early days, what's the most important thing to build? It's a guess. So don't stress about guessing. You're probably wrong. I would just accept being incorrect and leverage this as a way to help, help manage your roadmap better. The other big hang-up I see is people focusing on competition over customers. 
hear this all the time. Well, our competitor did this, so we felt compelled to do that. Like, it is absolutely critical not to copy your competition. One of, one of the easy examples is, um, what if the competition built something that the customers don't even want or need? It is very possible. There's an assumption that somehow they're geniuses. What if they're not? One of the most powerful things you do, I've done this in numerous instances, there's, there's cases where we have elected to not do something. Like we've explicitly said we don't want to build that yet. And what happens is, you know, maybe a customer is saying, well, hey, I really I want this feature, your you know, competitor XYZ has it. And what, what I often do is instead of defending you know, the fact that we don't have it, or instead of maybe, maybe suggesting that we're going to build it to copy, what I often do is like tell them the why behind not building it. Explain your reasoning. Say, you know, great, great re request, but hey, we didn't build it for this reason. What you hear often is like, wow, I didn't think about that. That's pretty, that's pretty profound. Yeah, maybe I don't need that thing. But you gotta let them get inside your head. Don't just assume that this thing exists that you should focus on it. Early in the company's history, I'll never forget, I met with a uh, co-founder of a company, CEO of a company, and I was sitting down and, um, you know, I'm sharing the idea of Pendo, it was very, very early days, and he's like, oh, this sounds just like some competitor. Uh, he's like, have you heard of them? I was like, no. Um, and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like, he was apologizing because I think I was just gonna like fold up and like, you know, okay, you're right, I'm done. Like, <laughs> I hadn't heard of this company, I'm giving it up right now. Um, I went back and I looked at it and it was very, very different, but um, the reality is is that um, I knew because we had good customer validation and good feedback from customers as a marketer, independent of what other people were doing. Obviously, they weren't solving this problem, um, or I wouldn't have the feedback from customers that I did. So always trust customers and always follow them over competition. The last piece is building a great culture. And this is uh, maybe obvious, but it's a lot harder than it sounds. This has been actually a huge, huge focus of the company, and we're very, very proud to, to have some recognition in this area. But I can tell you that it takes work. And it has to be intentional. You can't just show up one day and say, I want to have a great culture and just do nothing and assume it's just going to happen. That's probably a fundamental thing. Every interview I do, people say, how do you maintain a good culture? I say, we work really hard at it. I spend 20, 30, 40 spending my time on culture, internal, because it matters. You know, there's a great quote, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Simon Sinek says, customers will never love a company unless the employees love it first. Your employees love your company, it'll show through in how they service customers, how they take care, how they respond, how they treat people. That matters. And the reality is building a great culture is probably the best strategy we've had as a company. I think obviously we have good, we've got good products as well, but, but at the end of the day, um, having a great company, it makes up for other things. And the key is just about having good raw ingredients. I always say the raw ingredients in any culture is people. And to this day, I interview nearly every person at the company. We are about 350 people. That translates into some days five interviews on a day. On a weekly basis, it's probably um, close to 10 interviews in a week, maybe a little bit higher. And yes, it's an incredible um, amount of time, but the reality is there is no more important thing. You know, they say uh, hire slow, fire fast. I mean, I cannot emphasize this more. As I tell my recruiting team all the time, this is not about hitting numbers on a spreadsheet, it's about hiring the best possible human for the job, and if it takes longer, it takes longer. So I'd rather slow down a process and get the right person than not, and this is the most critical thing. But the other thing that I often hear uh, entrepreneurs miss is that this includes your board and your investors. How many entrepreneurs say, like, oh, it's just money. These VCs don't really do much, they just like, write you a check, you put it in the bank. That is completely not true. They can make your life a living hell if they want to. Like, do you want that? Like, if you don't want to have a beer with your investor or just want to hang, hang out, um, maybe it's the wrong person. You know, they say that when you get an investor, it's like getting married, but almost impossible to get divorced. I mean, literally almost impossible. And I've talked to many entrepreneurs that have wanted to divorce their investors, and it's just not a good thing. It's not good for the company. It's certainly not good for your stress levels. So in, interview the investors. Talk to references of the investors. Talk to the companies that aren't doing well. You will be able to find one or two companies that aren't doing well. 
What's their relationship like? Yeah, look, the high flyers, the one that are returning the fund, of course they're going to say good things. Everyone's happy. But what about the ones where like, they've done a down round or they had to have some layoffs or maybe they didn't get the exit they wanted? Like, those are the good references. And if the person was still a good person and someone that they could take a reference on, that's a good sign. That's what you want. That's what you want to build a business with. This is just as critical, even probably more critical than the average employee because they can affect your company in so many different ways. I am very fortunate to be happy with the investor syndicate that we have. Um, they do not create work for me. They are additive, and that's really important. So key takeaways, there's no real magic. Get the product right, obsess over customers, build a great culture. These are the three things. Of course, start getting the product right. This is where I would start. If you don't have a product, you're early in your product market fit journey, obsess over it. It is possible you can follow a formula. And the last one I focus on, the reason I use this logo, this is our first customer, first paying customer. And I'll never forget my job early on was just making this one person, Amy at, at Invoca, like incredibly successful. We obsessed every day I come to work. What did she do in the product today? You know, or, you know, and honestly, this obsession over this person um, led to really solid product market fit and led to the growth that, that we've seen today. Just get it right early and then the rest goes a lot easier. So thank you. I need some traction. You need some traction. Let's get some traction.